Hello, so my name is Darko Zibar and I will uh, be talking about uh, machine learning concepts in optical communication. And this is pretty new field uh, also for me and it actually originates from the, from the computer sciences where, for example, we use the methods from machine learning to build the probabilistic methods. So I'll try to talk about how we can actually link some of the concepts in machine learning to optical communications and to the current problem in optical communications. So the field of machine learning is about the, the learning from the observed data. And uh, the best example for the application of machine learning is a Google search engine. We actually learned that we have the algorithms and they learn about, for example, when, when you do the search about the user. So this, the same thing actually can be done by on the physical layer level. So we use the methods in machine learning to, to build the probabilistic models. And in the way that, for example, we have the observed data and we extract the parameters from the data and then we use this for the model generation. So this is very applicable for, the, for a system which exhibits non-linearities and also for the system which exhibits non-Gaussian additive noise. Because if, if you look at the field of optical communication, I mean, we've, there, there have been a lot of concepts which are taken from the wireless domain, but once we have non-linearities and non-additive white Gaussian noise, it becomes more challenging. But I believe after this talk that I, I will show you how we can actually deal with those problems of non-linearity and non-Gaussian noise. So one of the things that optical communication systems are becoming more and more complex, especially with the, with the introduction of space division and multiplexing. So I think from the, from the system designer point of view, it will be very important to have good models which can be actually be able to predict the system performance. So I will try to answer what can we actually benefit from the, from the very advanced techniques in machine learning. And if you look at the current challenges in optical communication, we see that the field of coherent detection with the advanced DSP is, 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 is relatively maturing now, and we have products even at 400 gigabits per second. So currently, there is also a lot of research work on, on the going to a larger constellations like 64 QAM, and uh, also there is a lot of research effort on a space division multiplex systems. But one of the fundamental that limit us from the, in, in the current state is the nonlinearity. So there is a lot of work on the nonlinearity mitigation and, and predictions. And also, the nonlinearity will gener generate a result that we, that we will be facing a very low signal-to-noise ratio. So we will also need to, to have some very good tools how to design receivers that operate at a low signal-to-noise ratio. So I will show you in this talk how we can actually use some of the things from the advanced statistical signal, process signal processing for the nonlinearity synthesis and for the carrier phase tracking where we, where we have a very large constellations. So this is the outline of my talk. So first, I will introduce the method of expectation maximization, which is a method of, of doing an iterative parameterism estimation in maximum likelihood sense. And this method, for example, allows you to iteratively estimate the parameters of a very complex systems. So then I will show how this method can be used for a nonlinear impairment synthesis. And this synthesis can then be used, for example, to model the system and also to predict the system behavior. And then I will move, switch a little bit gears and I will move to, into, the, into, for the, into the Bayesian filtering and how we can actually use the concepts from the Bayesian filtering for a carrier phase noise tracking and characterization. So in this concept, I will try to somehow explore and also to, to give some perspectives how actually techniques from the Bayesian filtering can be used for a characterization of, of of components like, for example, how can we characterize laser phase noise and laser amplitude noise. And then I will show how we can use these methods for actually for performing carrier synchronizations for 64 QAM and up to 192 gigabits per system. And I will end up this talk with the conclusion and future works. So if we look at the, one of the dominating charts in, in, in the literature, it's a, it's a nonlinear channel limit. I don't know if you can s scale this. I think, okay, you, you see the figure. So what is important here is that if we plot the spectral, achievable spectral deficiency in bits per second per hertz as a function of distance is decreasing due to the impairments in the fiber. So therefore, for example, nonlinearity it sets an upper bound on the spectral efficiency. And we, in order to, to move the system forwards, we need to know, know how, actually to, how to model the impairments and how we can actually predict the system impairment. And uh, in order to do that, we, have, uh, we would like to emulate our link. So for example, if we, have, if we have a figure here where we have a transmitter and then we transmit it to, the, to some of the fibers, we amplify it and so on. So what we want to do we, at the receiver, we want to learn from the observed data about the system. And once we have learned about 
to observe data from the system, then we want to emulate this. So actually we want to, we want to build a probabilistic model of the entire link and simulate it at, at the transmitter. So we want to build some kind of a very accurate link emulator for, especially in the case when, you, when the system is dominated by the signal nonlinearities. And we want to see how this impacts the system design and component characterization. So as shown in this plot here, one can see that, for example, this is a, this is a recover constellation from, uh, from the signal which suffers uh, nonlinear phase noise. And this experimentally obtained data. So what we can see here is that, for example, that, that the impairments, they have a distinct impact on the signal constellation. So for example, the, the high power symbols, they are more scattered and they're more compressed. So optical fiber channel, channel impairments will be imprinted on this signal constellation. So how can we use actually this information to mitigate the impairment and to learn something from the impairment? Because in the case of additive white Gaussian noise, we have circularly symmetric Gaussian, circularly symmetric uh, clusters, but in this case, I mean, due to the system nonlinearities, the clusters will be more distorted, and they will have more the elliptical waveform. So what you can do is, is that we can consider, for example, that, that the signal we, re we have received it can be described as a Gaussian mixture. So we want to actually construct the PDF of our received signal. And in this case, for example, we have a 16 clusters due to the 16 points in, in the 16 quantum constellation. So we assume that each of the clusters can be described by the, by the, by the two-dimensional Gaussian distribution. And the beauty about, the, about this is that we only need two parameters to characterize it. We need the, the means and the covariance matrix. So once we have the mean and the covariance matrix, we have the probability density functions of our, sig of our symbols. So in order to extract the, the means and the covariance matrices in the maximum likelihood sets, we use the expectation maximization method. And uh, once we have actually, so, so this is our true, I mean, demodulated constellation, which is the red and the blue curve. And then we run the algorithm to find the parameters that generated this data. And then what we do is, then we sample from the distribution. So in this case, we sample from the mixture of Gaussians. So, and then when we sample, then on the right, we have estima estimated X polarization and Y polarization. And we see in this case, when the, when the system is, 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 uh, is dominated by the, by the AVGN noise, because we have circular symmetric clusters, we see we have a very good, I mean, at least from, the, from, from this graph, very good representation of, of our true constellations. And this can be also used for estimating the impact of the impairments. So in figure two to the right, for example, we have a tilted constellation. And we have also impairments from the, from the transmitter, like an IQ modulator. So in this case, again, we, we learn from the, we, we, we run the system, and then we learn from the observed data about the system. And then we learn the parameters, and then we simply use you know, some standard sampling techniques to sample from the distribution and regenerate the data. As I can see, well, there is a very good correspondence between, for example, X polarization and estimate, estimated X polarization. So in this way, by sampling from the mixture of Gaussian, we can actually generate the synthetic data which has impairments. And uh, how well does the mixture of Gaussian represent the, the real data? Then, what we did is actually we, we plotted the log BR as a function of optical signal to noise ratio for the case where we run the full simulation. So we have our full model with the, with the, with the transmitter, with the, with the noise loading, and then with the receiver. And then we learn the distribution, and then we plot again. So this is called the true beta array. And then we sample from the distribution, and we have the synthetic symbols, which are generated with the same probability distribution. As one can see from the figure to the left, there is a very good correspondence. So one application of this could be, for example, for, uh, that one can save a lot of time in doing a system modeling in doing it in this way. But what is interesting is how well does this mixture of Gaussian represents the data when you are in the nonlinear regime. So then we did a simulation where we, where we, we were again plot the log BR as a function of input power, where we plot the true beta rate, which is the one actually that is obtained after running it. This was done for 1,000 kilometers. And then we learn about the system. And then we sample from the, from the PDF. And then we plot again the data. So as one can see, I mean, if in the linear regime there, and in the nonlinear regime, there is a good agreement. But this BR we extracted from the EVM. And since EVM is, it requires some, some assumptions, then we also plotted the counted beta rate. Because this is a symbol based. And, so there is, in the nonlinear regime, as expected, there is a slight deviation between the, between the counted BR and the BR extracted from, from the Q factor. But in general, in this way, we are able to emulate the OSNR and, 
and a, and a nonlinearity. And we can see there is a very good agreement between the synthetic and the true data generation. So the next step, of course, is to go from the symbol level to the bit level. So for example, if you have a bits, and then you can actually induce this impairment and then do the true bit error rate counting in order to really evaluate how, how well is, uh, is the system behaving. So next, I will move for, to, uh, to a field of, of, of Bayesian filter on our tracking. And uh, I think Bayesian most, most commonly used example of a Bayesian filtering is a Kalman filter, where you can actually, for example, use it in radaring to track the targets. So for example, everything that has these dynamical states, it can be used to track by the Bayesian filter. So they're very useful for dynamical systems, and they're also very applicable for, for a nonlinear system where you don't have not additive Gaussian noise. And what, what this approach is doing is, is, is based on a state space approach. So actually you have your observation, then you have the parameters you want to estimate. And from the observation, you're all the time using you know, recursively estimating the parameters. And what you're doing actually at each step, you're estimating the posterior probability density function of the states. So you have a very generative model for, for the description of your systems. And from the PDF, you can, you can estimate the mean and the covariance of the state vector. And uh, I will show how this can be used for, for carrier synchronization in, for, for coherent optical systems. So basically, this is, the, this is the, one of the examples showing what, what's going on. Because for example, the states, it can be something that we define. It can be a PMD vector, or it can be a phase noise. So this is the trajectory, for, for instance, of the phase noise. So the, these red circles correspond, for example, samples at, the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at some instance of the time. Then these are the, the noise observations, which are far away from the, from the instances where we have observed. So what we then do, we, we create at each sampling point a posterior PDF. And from this posterior PDF, we infer the mean and the covariance. So in this way, one can actually you know, because, for example, the green, curve, the, the green uh, circle is much closer to the, to the, to the true position, for example, than, than the blue one. So in a way, you are actually filtering the noise. That's why it's called Bayesian filtering. So the entire principle is that, for example, this is the, just the graphical model that, I mean, it's described by two equations. You have equations describing your states, which is, for example, x, k, and given, and you have a function which describes how your states are evolving. So if you look at the, this is described as a Markov model. You have the states where, for example, there's only dependency from the current to the next state. And then there is a function describing how, how evolution from the current to the next state is. And there can also be some noise parameters which is disturbing this transition. And then there is observation which is actually linking by a linear or nonlinear function the, the states to the observations. And then we have non-observable outputs, which is the parameters that we want to estimate, for example, the phase, or for example, it can be also do, done, used for equalization, or we have a PMD vector. And then we have observable outputs. And then we have some noise parameters, like process noise and a measurement noise. So in this case, this is bo both F and K and H and K can be on nonlinear functions. So what we do from the time instant K to, a time, to next time instant, we are we are constructing the recursively the PDF function. So we, for example, we want to compute what is the posterior probability of the, of the non-observable variables like the phase noise or a PMD vector given the observations from 1 to k. So actually, this is just to show that, for example, there, there are only two steps involved. There is a step where you compute the prior because you're computing the, the probability density function of your state k given the observations from 1 to k minus 1. So you are doing the prediction. So once the new measurement arrives, then you update your prediction. So you have a, you have a posterior. So in that case, you compute the probability of x a k given the observable values from 1 to k. So this is just the basics. So you're doing all the time this iterative computation. And uh, typically, if, if you assume that, you have, uh, that your posterior has a Gaussian distribution, then you and you have a linear system, then it reduces to the common filtering. But in, in many cases, this, this integration is, is intractable, and so you need to do some approximation. So there are some different methods, like, like particle filtering, where you can actually approximate the distribution. So after, after some step that you are that, that approximated, the, 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 this, the, the particles will actually, actually converge to the true distribution. So even though it sounds so complex, so I wanted to actually to test it how it works in practice. And this is experimental setup, which was uh, performed at the CPQD in Brazil. So you wanted to see how actually Bayesian tracking is performing when you have a large signal constellation. Because for a 64 quam, the requirements on the laser alignment are quite stringent. 
And so this is the, the basically the setup. We use the digital to analog converter, which is operating at 64 giga samples per second to, to generate the data. We have IQ modulator, just typical setup. Do we do the palm max and the noise loading, and then we have a coherent receiver. And then the laser landed was around, I think it was around 100 kilohertz. And then uh, we do the offline signal processing. So actually what we do is, we, there are two ways of, of doing it, because in this case you, you will have a nonlinear equation describing your, the, the connection between your states and observable variables. So one can either use external camel filter, or there are some meth other methods which are working on like a Gaussian particle filter, where you don't take the approximations in order to, to predict the states. And uh, this is the recover constellation. So we also, because we are at the same time doing a parameter estimation, then we also plotted the, the optimum decision boundary in the maximum likelihood sense, just to make sure that our system is dominated by the AVGN, that there are, that there are no impairments from our, from our transmitter, because that would tilt the constellation. Then we, pl we plot the beta rate as a function of OSNR in 0.1 nanometer bandwidth. And then we actually benchmark it as a as, uh, with the very commonly used method of of carrier synchronization, of, and which is called blind phase search, where you just try different test phases and to find the, the best one. And we see actually for the, for the low optical signal-to-noise ratio that using this you know, extended common filter approach, it outperforms the blind phase search. And we noticed that in this case, because of the limited resolution of the DAC and of the limited bandwidth, we were really, uh, the signals was very much distorted. So believe, for example, we believe, for example, that you have a lot of distortion in the signal constellation and, also, then in this case, you know, this, using these more complex optimal methods will be better than just using the brute force methods for the, for the carrier phase estimation. So this brings me to the end of my talk. So basically, I mean, this is something new we started working on. So we are actually interested in this probabilistic modeling of nonlinear impairments and how we can use this method to emulate the systems. And so far, we have a very good agreement between the synthetic data and the true data. So the next step is actually to go to the lab and actually verify that this is, that this is valid. And I've also shown some examples of the Bayesian filtering, how it can be used for, uh, for a carrier phase tracking. And we have seen that it has a very good performance for a low signal-to-noise ratio. So the next thing that we are working on is actually how to use this filtering to characterize the components, because you can actually get very good resolution of characters when you want to characterize your components. You can actually characterize both the amplitude and the phase noise of your, for, example, for instance, a laser. And then we're also looking into how to learn the distributions of the underlying system, because we've assumed, for example, that we have a, you know, that we have a mixture of Gaussians, but in many cases, this is just an approximation. So we are trying to figure out what is, how actually to learn about the exact distribution of the, of the system. And then I would like to thank to the the people who have contributed to this work. So, thank you very much. So, I'll just... So, there's maybe a question? Yes. So, do you need additional memory? Do you need additional memory or not here? You, or you just using the filtering? Uh, I, mean, so, I mean, so, yeah, you're using this uh, machine, learning, uh, machine, uh, machine learning technology. Usually, they need to do memory to, to, means, yeah, to, 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 to get some information, the previous information, you need to store. Yes, uh, you, you can use it, for example, if you, if you say I want to, I go to the lab and I measure, like, I measure, for example, from, let's say, from 400 to 800 kilometers. And then I, I, I learn, so I use this as a training period. So I, I, I learn about the system from 400 to 800 kilometers. Then I can use this to predict actually how is going the system going to behave for 1,000, for 1,500, or for 2,000 kilometers. So you need, to, you need to have a training phase, and after the training phase, you can do the prediction. No, no, you're not using any training sequences, but you need to have a training period in general for, for, for example, for training the system. Okay, so, Chris, yes. Yeah. Um, just to play devil's advocate, I mean, um, maximum likelihood and MAP principles have been the underpinnings of communication for many decades, and it's only when the computer scientists adopted them that they brought um, artificial intelligence off the dustbin and revived it with a new name, machine learning. So how 
can this be an improvement over what we're already doing since we're already basing what we're doing on ML and MAP? Well, I th you're right in, in, in this part, but it, it, I think we need to look for a new applications. And I, for example, for, uh, when you, for example, if you have a no system non-narratives and you have a non-additive white Gaussian noise, then it's very difficult to, to estimate the parameters analytically, for instance. So you need to use some iterative method of, of parameter estimation. And it's true, I mean, the methods have been there, but I think the application of the methods will be new, in this sense. Uh, for example, um, the methods you're using don't um, take account of the underlying physical principles, like um, the NLSE generated the nonlinearity, so your Gaussian mixtures can't be used, for example, to test a backpropagation algorithm because they weren't generated according to the physical principle that, that, that governs the system. Well, okay, I, so, so what you do, I think you can, you, you're, what you're doing actually, yeah, yeah, that you're, you, you're taking some of the assumptions when you're using this one, that's correct. But it's still, if, if for example, if you, we propagated through the, for example, from the nonlinear channel in one of the curves I show, one of the V curves I show. So we propagated, we saw the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, and then we, we, we see the demodulated constellation. And then from this constellation, we generate the data. And then we do exactly the same. So it somehow represents the system. But it doesn't capture the memory. No, you're right. It doesn't capture the memory, yes. But it can be extended to capture the memory. But then the only efficient way to do that is to use the NLSE. Yeah, that, that's correct. But for example, when you have a WDM system, then it's quite hard to... It's, an, it's an, somehow an alternative to NLSE. But for a WDM system, for example, if you, if you go to the lab and measure the... For example, the impact of, of the cross of your, of your neighboring channels, then you can actually... Then you can actually model it... Okay, yeah, then you have either choice of solving a couple nonlinear Schrodinger equation or doing it this way. So I think for a WDM system, this, this may be advantages compared to just doing the NLSA. But it, it's, it's an open question, so it's something to look into.